So we're going to look today at holiday entitlement and the, 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 the changes that will be coming into effect next year in relation to part year and irregular hours workers holiday entitlement. Whilst the focus of our session today is on the way these changes impact part year and irregular hours workers, some other changes that, that they've introduced affect all types of worker and where relevant, we'll make that clear to you during this morning session. We will look at how and uh, when the law is changing, and we'll consider some key features of the new law that affect how it might work in practice. Um, we'll then go on to consider who will be uh, considered a part year worker and then an irregular hours worker as defined in the new regulations and where those gray areas might be for particular workers. We will also consider the practical impact of the new law or on those holiday pay calculations and we'll explore rolled up holiday pay in a little bit more detail. And finally, we'll draw out some practical learning points to help you plan for these changes. So that's what we're going to cover today. Um, I thought it would be helpful to do a, a quick recap of where we are currently in relation to um, holiday uh, entitlement in relation uh, to these to, to, to workers. So um, the Supreme Court uh, in Brazil confirmed in the summer of 2022 that according to the law uh, as it currently stands, there is no prorating mechanism that allows holiday for part year and irregular hours workers to be calculated in proportion to their working hours. The judgment was hugely significant for many UK employers with lots uh, having to make up holiday uh, pay shortfall uh, to, to their affected staff. In recognition of the fact that the Brazil judgment had produced something of a windfall really for, for part year and irregular hours workers, the government earlier this um, year consulted on uh, changing the law to introduce a pro rata mechanism to calculate holiday entitlement for permanently retained part year and irregular hours workers. And this consultation, as you may know, closed earlier this year and the government, the government have now um, confirmed that it will go ahead with a pro rata mechanism. Um, there was also a separate consultation um, also this year uh, that proposed certain changes to the working time regulations and in particular the ability to roll up holiday pay for certain types of workers. Uh, again this proposal has has been confirmed and, and I will touch on that a little later on. If we can move on to the next slide then Ellie please. Thanks Rebecca. Um, so now that Rebecca's set the scene in relation to what's coming up and what's happened in the past in the Brazil judgment, we're going to look a little bit at what's changing um, and the introduction of the Employment Rights Regulations uh, 2023. So for the purposes of today's session, we're going to focus on the changes on the slide in front of you. So changes that really affect part year workers and irregular hours workers. But as something of an aside, the new regulations also do bring in some other changes. So they bring in some changes to Tupi. So changes around um, what would constitute a micro business. So um, it's going to move up to 50 or fewer staff. Um, there's also some changes around uh, the EU derived annual leave carryover rights for um, sickness and family uh, leave. So that's going to be enshrined in the new regulations so that that is carried over. Um, so 5.6 weeks holiday is going to be carried over for those on maternity or family leave. And the four weeks EU leave is going to be carried over for those who can't take their holiday due to sickness. Um, and they'll be able to take that leave within 18 months of that holiday year ending. And there's also going to be some changes to record keeping. So. There was a bit of confusion around whether employers were required to uh, keep records of the daily um, hours worked by employees. And so the new regulations make it clear to employers that that's not necessary, that they need to keep adequate records, but they don't need to be keeping a tally of daily hours worked. 
So it relieves a bit of the administrative burden on employers. Um, so if we look in a bit more detail now about um, the changes for part year workers um, and for regular hours workers. So the regulations seek to achieve a number of things. So they seek to define who will be considered a part year worker and who will be a an irregular hours worker. So they give a bit more clarity for employers to understand um, the position in relation to the staff they have and the arrangements that they have in place. They also set in place um, a mechanism to be able to prorate the accrual of holiday for part year and irregular hours workers. So that's now going to be at the rate of 12.07%, which many of you will remember pre brazil lots of ACAS guidance said that um, holiday could be calculated on that basis. So it'll be familiar to you. And it will be a welcome change for employers because it reverses the position that Rebecca talked about around the windfall for um, casual workers and part year workers, where they were receiving a disproportionately higher amount of holiday than their all year round colleagues. Um, and it also introduces or reintroduces rolled up holiday pay. And Rebecca's going to talk about that in more detail um, as we come on to it later in the session. But rolled up holiday pay essentially was um, found to be inconsistent with EU law. And as a consequence of that, whilst widely used in the past, has sort of been outlawed in more recent years, although used still in some sectors like higher education for, um, for example, uh, casual lecturers who um, don't have regular hours. So if we look at the current position, so the working time regulations currently provide for all workers to receive 5.6 weeks holiday, paid holiday a year. This entitlement is derived from two different pots of leave um, under the existing regulations. So regulation 13 um, covers the first four weeks of EU derived leave um, and regulation 13A covers the balance of 1.6 weeks domestic leave and together that creates your 5.6 weeks leave. So with the changes coming into effect, this is going to be disapplied for part year and irregular hours workers. So that they will have essentially one pot of holiday leave rather than the two pots that year round workers get. Um, <clears throat> and the government had an opportunity and was consulting about the possibility of doing this for all year round workers um, so that they would all have one pot and one way of calculating um, holiday entitlement and pay. But that wasn't taken forward within um, the outcome of that consultation. So it means that this one pot applies just to your irregular hours um, and part year workers. And so the changes are due to come into effect um, on the 1st of January next year. That's when the regulations um, come into force. However, um, the changes for um, how you calculate holiday pay and entitlement for your part year and irregular hours workers um, don't start until um, the holiday year following the 1st of April next year. So for those of you who align your holiday year to the calendar year, that would mean that um, from the 1st of January 2025, it will come into effect for you. Uh, for those of you in education who um, align your holiday year to the academic year, it's going to be 1st of September next year. So there's a bit of a staggered start for when this will apply. And until that point, the current position will continue to apply. You need to be uh, paying holiday to staff under the current arrangements. So that's the post Brazil arrangements of 5.6 weeks holiday a year. <clears throat> so if we move on to the next slide. So let's have a look at a bit more detail of how the regulations define part year and irregular hours workers, um, as this will determine the new arrangements and how they will apply. So firstly, if we look at part year workers, you've got the deck at the Sorry, the definition in front of you there on the screen. So a part year worker is a worker uh, in relation to a leave year 
sorry, a worker is a part year worker in relation to a leave year if, under the terms of their contract, they are required to work only part of that year and there are periods within the year during the term of their contract of at least a week which they're not required to work and for which they're not paid. So let's unpack that a little bit. So there needs to be a continuing contract in place. And during that contract, the worker has periods where they're not required to work. And those periods have got to be for a week or more. Um, periods of sickness, for example, don't count towards that week or more. Um, and there needs to be pay periods that they're not paid for uh, when they're not working. So this would appear to cover arrangements such as turn time working, uh, seasonal work, uh, contracts where workers work a number of weeks on and a number of weeks off on a rotating basis. Um, but would this cover salaried part year workers whose pay is annualised over the course of the year um, so that they receive their salary during the periods when they're not working? So our view would be that the inclusion of the highlighted word for in this definition would make that possible. Although they receive pay during uh, periods that they're not working, their salary calculation does not provide for these periods. So in those circumstances, they would be seen as a part year worker. And as a consequence, you'd be able to apply the new regime of being able to prorate their holiday entitlement, even if they're paid all year round on an annualized salary. Uh, there are periods, obviously, for a week or more where they're not required to work. As with any new legislation, it's always open to interpretation. And so this is how we're reading regulations at the moment. But it may be with case law developing um, and with guidance that the government promises for next year um, that things develop and, and the position evolves. But for salaried part year workers, uh, that's the position as we see it. Um, and for staff potentially on sabbaticals, it may be that um, they could be classed as part year workers if that's agreed in their sabbatical arrangements. But that would need to be made clear in that agreement so that um, it's clear that there are periods where they're not required to work and they're not being paid for those. And that would alleviate some of the financial burden of holiday accruing or that individual's not at work um, and performing their duties. So if we move on to the next slide, please, Ellie, and look at irregular hours workers in a bit more detail. So definition is here on the slide. A worker is an irregular hours worker in relation to a leave year if the number of paid hours that they will work in each pay period during the term of their contract in that year uh, is under the term of their contract wholly or mostly variable. And it's the wholly and mostly variable uh, part here that's the key takeaway. That's going to be determinative of whether they're an irregular hours worker. At the moment, there's no guidance as to what wholly or mostly variable means. And so, again, it's something that might be open to interpretation with case law as things develop. But if you take it at its ordinary meaning, you would be looking to see when someone's uh, working, is the majority of their shift pattern or their work um, flexible? Um, or do their hours change on a regular basis? Are they an ad hoc worker, a casual worker, zero, zero hours worker comes in uh, depending on um, the needs of your business. And so uh, the definition applies in relation to a leave year. This suggests that the status can potentially change uh, from leave year to, leave, to the next year leave year. Um, so that's something to bear in mind that um, you need to look at it on sort of a rolling basis each year. Is that what's happening in practice? Um, and then the relevant number of hours um, is the number of work in each pay period. So you may have uh, zero hours workers uh, who are paid weekly. You might have zero hours workers who are paid monthly. And depending on that pay period will be um, the period in which you are looking at whether their hours are variable during that time. Um, and it needs to be under uh, the terms of their contract. So to be an irregular hours worker and to fit this definition, their contract needs to provide for their hours to vary and change, be wholly and mostly variable. 
So if your contracts don't currently say that, that's something to think about in terms of updating them. Um, one slightly complicating factor, if we look at um, the uh, second definition there on this slide, is that where a worker works under two contracts for the same employer, um, the new regulations seek to look at things holistically. So even though they might have one contract where they worked fixed number of hours and another contract where they work flexibly and work variable hours, the idea under Regulation 15F is to put that together in one pot and look at it overall. So overall is the work that they do um, seem to be uh, wholly or mostly variable um, in terms of the hours that they work um, and it's looked at in the round. So essentially, this is telling employers to pull all the working hours under the contract together um, and to look at and assess that combined amount of hours to see overall, does it vary or is it mainly static? If it's mainly static, then they won't be an irregular hours worker in either of the contracts. So um, if we take an example, um, you could have, for example, um, a year-round administrator working in a theatre who has a, con a casual contract to pick up some shift work in theatre bar uh, some evenings, but not all, um, on an ad hoc basis. Um, would the theatre work then make that person an irregular hours worker, um, or would their substantive contract mean that both contracts should be looked at as an all-year-round contract? So, according to uh, the new definition in the regulations, you would look at it in the round. And if most of the work that they do is on a fixed contract, fixed hours, then they will be considered to be an all year round regular hours worker. They'll be entitled to 5.6 weeks holiday. And that would apply to the work that they do for the bar shifts, as well as the work that they do um, <clears throat> for their substantive role. However, um, that doesn't mean that they get... Uh, uh, two lots of the same entitlement, this means that they get the uh, pay equivalent for the hours that they work um, on the bar contract added into their 5.6 weeks holiday. So one way to address that might be to pay rolled up holiday pay for the bar work. Um, and Rebecca will talk a bit more about rolled up holiday pay as we progress in the session. Um, uh, or to have the bar work as um, overtime as part of the substantive contract. Um, so that it's paid um, with that work rather than a separate contract. If we move on to the next slide, please. And we look a little bit more detail at um, holiday calculations. So for part year and regular hours workers, um, the new calculation will be to calculate holiday based on 12.07% of the number of hours worked in a pay period. And there's a cap that applies to that so that a zero hours worker doesn't accrue more holiday than the equivalent 5.6 weeks that an all year round worker has and is entitled to. Um, and so then you calculate the hourly rate of pay um, and that's based on um, the amount of a week's pay divided by the weekly hours. Um, and then you calculate 12.07% accrued hours at the correct hourly rate of pay. So it's quite a straightforward way of accrual um, and um, it uh, accrues at the end of each pay period. So at the end of a monthly paid employee, you would be able to work out what they accrued in that period by looking at the total number of hours that they've worked um, and you would be able to then assess what they're accruing as their employment continues. And when they take their pay, you would be working out what their hourly rate of pay is at that point um, and um, they would be able to take their holiday at that time and be paid for it. So if we move on to the next slide, please. And um, we look at a worked example just to go through that. So um, say, for example, a worker works 10 hours in a pay period. Um, they're paid weekly. So 12.07% of those 10 hours is going to equate to uh, 1.2 uh, hours of holiday pay. 
that they've accrued in that week. The hourly rate of pay for that individual uh, is uh, the is fifty pounds per hour. Uh, so uh, the one point uh, two hours of holiday pay uh, is going to work out at sixty pounds. So working the way through it, you can see how simple it is now to calculate uh, what that entitlement is going to be. So if we move on to the next slide, and I'll hand you back to Rebecca. Thanks, Joe. So we're going to cover now um, what pay elements are included. And, and we know from the working time regulations that workers are entitled to be paid at the rate of a week's pay for each week of their leave. So this appears straightforward at first, um, and uh, it, it it, it's a concept that, that should be um, straightforward to put in place, but in reality, it's given rise to uh, a lot of confusion as to, as to how to calculate this. And the reason for that is because of different rules applying to the EU-derived holiday. And that EU-derived holiday is the first four weeks of leave, which um, must be paid in accordance with a worker's what we call normal remuneration and then the domestic holiday so the additional 1.6 weeks of leave to get you to the 5.6 and um, which can be paid at the potentially less generous rate of pay so it's paid at the basic pay and some employers may choose to choose to apply these different rates of pay um to the different rates of leave. So you would have a different rate for the first four weeks and a different rate for the remaining 1.6 weeks to make a financial saving. But what this has done is it leads to confusion for, for both employers and also for employers seeking to understand their entitlements of what, what they are um, receiving and why they're receiving that. So the new regulations attempt to clarify this for part year and irregular hour workers and Really, the key takeaway uh, from this is that if your organisation currently applies different holiday pay rates to different types of leave, you will no longer be able to do this for part year and irregular workers um, when these regulations take effect from, from next year. Um, and the new regulations set out what pay elements must be included in calculating that week's pay for part year and irregular hour workers. Year round workers are also um, affected by this particular change, um, albeit in a slightly different way. So year round workers will continue to be entitled to the four weeks of EU derived leave and the 1.6 weeks domestic leave, but different rules will be attached to each category of leave. But the new regulations um, represent the government's attempt to essentially codify the pay elements that the EU law uh, currently says must be included um, in the holiday pay calculations for those four first four weeks of leave. So right now, we don't know whether that will help or hinder uh, the calculations, um, especially as pay elements such as um, discretionary bonus for performance related bonuses, maybe car allowance, they arguably fall within the scope of the new regulations. As you can see here on, on this slide that we've got up, it, it, it sets out what is included when calculating. So that's the week's pay for the first four weeks um, for a year uh, round worker, but for, for, for holiday pay for a week's pay for part year and irregular hours. Um, and so as you can see, it's payments linked to performance. So that's commission uh, commission payable and, and payments for professional and personal status uh, for an employee so that for length of service seniority and professional qualifications um, and then other payments such as overtime regularly paid in the 52 weeks that's that's nothing new that last one and um, that that the regular overtime um, that is paid uh, to staff and um, if we then go to the next slide, um, I'll touch on rolled up holiday pay. Um, the ability to roll up holiday pay is now to be introduced, um, but only in respect of part year and irregular worker holiday entitlement. So we've been through 
what the regulations uh, defines as a as, as part year and irregular worker and it is those individuals that you'll be able to roll up their holiday pay the regulation itself um, on rolled up holiday pay it's straightforward uh, so it allows for the 12.07 uplift to the pay for work done and what's important is it, it must also be paid at the time the worker is paid for the work as this is linked to um, holiday entitlement that comes into effect on or after the 1st of April. This also therefore only comes into effect at that time. Uh, however, in practice, you may well be already rolling up holiday pay uh, for certain types of work. And, and actually, it's a very good practical way to continue to manage holiday pay for these atypical atypical workers and um, who may not be able to work or take holiday in the usual way and you can therefore carry on on doing that and for those part year and regular workers who are you're not doing that for it, it might be something to look at and so finally um on the final slide here as employers you will be planning what you need to do and um, if we go to the next slide ellie um in order to, to, to prepare for these changes, what is it that we think that, that we need to be doing? So if you employ permanently retained part year or irregular hours workers, you'll want to review your contracts of employment to see what they say in order to determine really whether any updates are required or not. You may want to refer to the 12.07% uh, accrual rate, for example, or clarify in your contracts that rolled up holiday pay will be paid going forward, if that's applicable. The extent of the um, necessary contractual changes will depend on the contractual wording um, that's currently in place in your contracts of employment. For new starters, you'll be able to update your contracts and issue them according to the new law. For any new starters who commence employment before the new law takes effect, so leave years that start on or after the 1st of April 2024, you may wish to issue contracts to reflect the new law and then include perhaps a side letter to make provision for a temporary pay top up to the unreduced statutory entitlement. Um, if you're planning to change the contracts of employment for existing staff, you will need to uh, consult on the proposed variations to those contracts. Um, and you'll need time to plan and to follow a consultation procedure um, and of course we can help with that. For year-round workers you're unlikely to need to make any contractual changes um, but for staff who are in receipt of pay elements such as bonuses and car allowances you may wish to take advice in respect of the operation of the new law on those holiday pay calculations given we have just gone through that what pay elements are included um, and potentially additional elements are now included in the provision of those four weeks for the year round workers. And it may be that you that you look at that to see whether the, the, the calculation for that week's pay is missing anything at all. And so that's a, a quick roundup of the changes that are coming into into effect. And um, we can have a look at some questions now had a few questions in quite a few questions so the first question was what about employers who haven't changed their payments following brazil would employees have to claim for unpaid holiday um up until the time of the change so i suppose there's two questions in there one what happens um or uh, do these changes impact the existing claims for unpaid holiday so essentially no so if you haven't been paying holiday um, at the uh, rate provided for after the Brazil judgment, so 5.6 weeks holiday for your part year or regular hours workers, then those claims still exist um, until the changes come into effect. And so um, employees can still pursue those claims. And there's a two year backstop in terms of the period that they can claim for. So um, that gives you some comfort in terms of the amount that could be claimed. But yes, the, the, the law as it stands currently applies until this takes uh, goes into effect. Um, and then uh, the point about uh, what about um, those who haven't changed their payments following Brazil. So um, you're not in a position where you have to row back from any changes, which is probably quite helpful for you. 
Um, so, but it does mean that you would be uh, looking to put in place those new pro rata mechanisms. So making sure that you're using 12.07 um, and that you're thinking about any additional pay elements that Rebecca have just gone through in terms of um, the entitlement when you're looking at the rate of pay. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, There's a question here about whether does overtime attract um, holiday pay? Um, and as it stands at the moment, um, you should already be paying uh, holiday pay for for overtime to staff. That, that that's overtime that's guaranteed, compulsory, regular um, for at least that first four weeks of leave. Um, and the new regulations state that permanently retained part year and regular workers um, overtime that is regularly paid. Um, regularly paid in the 52 weeks before that calculation date must be included in that calculation for a week's um, pay for holiday pay purposes. So a mate, perhaps a mate, as we just went through them, uh, uh, perhaps a mate more straightforward way um, of approaching regular overtime could be to roll up that holiday pay into the into the hourly rate for those workers um, and pay it at the time that 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 overtime is payable to them. We've had another question here about um, casual workers. So the question is, if the casual worker is paid by the hour, I assume you just use the hourly rate when paying their 12.07 holiday entitlement. Mm -hmm. And the straightforward answer to that is yes, providing they're not doing anything um, on top of that hourly rate that would incur some form of bonus, some form of additional payment that's covered in that calculation. But if they're paid that hour, uh, that hourly rate, and there are no other factors that would increase that, then um, just applying it to the 12.07 would work. Um, there's another question here about if someone is granted extended leave, um, e.g. three months unpaid, are we now within our rights to stop holiday accrual for those three months? So the answer here is that um, part of it will depend on what's agreed about the period of unpaid leave. But um, if the employment relationship is continuing, then holiday does continue to accrue. But um, you may be able to, within the terms of that leave arrangement, say that that period, the three months that they're not working for, makes them a part year worker. So during that period of time, um, that holiday year, they accrue their holiday um, on a pro rata basis rather than a full 5.6 weeks. So there's an opportunity there when you're agreeing those terms to uh, reduce the holiday entitlement, but not to absolve uh, the holiday entitlement um, entirely. We've got a lot of doubled up questions, so I'm just trying to go through to make sure that we're not repeating the same. There is one here that says um, we employ somebody who works full time in one role, but also does some casual or regular hours work for us under a separate contract. Um, will she count as an irregular hours worker? So Joe, Joe touched on this earlier. Um, no, she won't be an irregular hours worker because the regulations expressly state that where workers have more than one contract um, with the same employer, uh, you effectively need to look at the total, sorry, the total number of working hours um, across all the contracts and then determine whether the hours are wholly or mostly variable, variable, and if they're not, um, then they the, that worker will not be a, an irregular hours worker. So, in a case like this one, um, if the worker has one full time position, um, the hour those hours are unlikely to be wholly or mostly variable um, for this definition. Um, essentially, it seems to be saying that the irregular hours attaches to the worker rather than to the contract, um, which I think is a helpful way of looking at it. Uh, just thinking about ways around that, uh, maybe uh, making her a part year worker under the regulations um, or treating the casual workers overtime, um, which may or may not attract holiday pay if you're able to do that, but the, the, there can be other ways to look at it. We've got um, a question here, just to confirm, is the 12.07% holiday pay instead of 5.6 weeks? 
yes, essentially for irregular hours and part year workers, it's a way of calculating the accrual of holiday for those individuals. Um, and the cap on it means that they won't get more than 28 days, which translates to 5.6 weeks holiday. Um, time for a couple more questions. Um, can you please run over the effective date again? So uh, the effective date, to bear in mind, the regulations come into force on the 1st of January next year. But in terms of the new calculation methods, it's staggered depending on your holiday year. So for holiday years starting after the 1st of April next year, that's when it will come into effect. So if your holiday year runs with the calendar year, then it will be from uh, 1st of January 2025 for you. If it runs with the academic year, then it's going to be 1st of September 2024. Um, we've got another question here. Can you pay the entitlement twice a year or does it have to be paid monthly? So um, quite an interesting question because when um, employers were looking at how to um, uh, address the matters after um, the Brazil judgment, uh, there was um, one approach where you would pay holiday entitlement at points within the year um, to uh, ensure that it was balanced out across the year. Here, it accrues during each pay period. So if you're monthly paid, it's accruing during that month, but you don't necessarily have to pay it at the end of that month if the individual doesn't want to take holiday at that time. So it's paid at the time that the individual takes the holiday, um, unless you're going with a rolled up holiday approach that Rebecca went through. So if you're rolling up holiday, it's paid as part of their normal salary or normal uh, hourly rate. Um, and it's down to them to decide when they take holiday. So they've been paid in advance for it. They wouldn't receive pay at the point that they take it. So hopefully that addresses that question. Have we covered most of them, Rebecca? Are there any others that? I think so. I'm looking at mo this. A lot of a lot of people are asking the same questions. Same questions. And um, so I think that we we'll probably leave it there. Um, but. Um, as I said earlier, um, this this has been recorded, and so you'll get all the slides and the recording as well um, early next week. And and thank you all very much for for coming on and joining us today, um, and 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 listening to us talk. And I think we've just got a feedback poll um, if uh, anyone would like to uh, respond to that. So it should be up on your screen at the moment. Please do give us your feedback. Um, it's always really helpful to know what you think. Um, most people have filled it in now. Thank you. And also, just in case you're interested, because we've been talking about holiday pay and we've been talking about some issues um, that affect you uh, within your workplace, we've actually developed some training as well for other areas of employment law. Um, it's designed to help and support and empower managers dealing with um, employment and HR issues. Um, it covers things like disciplinaries, investigations, flexible working requests, grievances, all of the day-to-day -day things that you might experience in the workplace. So if you're interested perhaps in learning a little bit more about that training and how it might work for your organisation, please do fill in this poll. Thank you. I think most of you have done that. Great. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Um, that brings an end to our session. Uh, hope you have a great rest of your day.